Hi, everyone. I'm Eran, CEO and co-founder of LifeMode, where we're fixing home Wi-Fi using AI. So more than half the homes in Europe have access to 100 megabits or more of broadband internet. This is quite fast. Three out of the four fastest countries in the world are in the Nordics. We have found, however, that users get these high speeds for less than 40% of the time they're home. Typical user will call their ISP about twice a year. We've probably all been there, done this. About half of these are to complain about connectivity, which today usually means Wi-Fi. A Wi-Fi call is a brutal affair that usually takes about half hour. The call center agent just sort of tries things, reboots the modem, maybe changes the channel. They eventually run out of options, and they either just replace the modem or dispatch a tech who ends up doing the same thing. We have found that more than 80% of modems replaced in this fashion are not broken, and after basic tests, will be sent right back out into the field, just delaying the problem. Wi-Fi is not magic, although I'm sure it does seem that way to a lot of people who work with it. All you need to do is configure the software on the Wi-Fi devices correctly after you have deployed the correct hardware. The, our team working on this is comprised of veterans and passionate developers. My co-founder, Budish, and I each have more than 15 years of experience in telecoms. The team has spent more than five years together as flatmates, lab mates, and office mates. And we're a group of Wi-Fi cloud and AI experts. Now, this is a fairly uncommon mix that has allowed us to build our core product, which gathers information continually from modems in the field, along with the call center, and takes this up into our cloud, where all the data is processed every day to generate insights and predictors for the ISP to analyze and fix problems, often before the users even know they are there. The real magic starts to happen when the call center can provide supervision into our algorithms through a series of generated specific questions, questions generated specifically for that household, we can validate or invalidate our hypotheses so that our algorithms, our machine learning starts getting better, and we can actually project high impact fixes to the entire population. Looking at all the data allowed us to observe trends that were before hidden, such as the correlation between, for a city, the usage of neighbors' Wi-Fi and data loss. Insights like this allowed us to build an AI that can customize the software for every single home, such as our feature that will choose your channel and power based on the behavior of your neighbors that the system learns on a per-household level. We're coming up on 100,000 households now deployed in Norway and Turkey, with a pilot launching soon in Finland. We're raising cash now to address the entirety of the Nordics and the Benelux region. In the first year that we've been deployed, we've been able to reduce calls to our pilot ISPs by 10%. This is before the full system has kicked in for the entire year. We believe that we can move this number up to 20% with our new technology after we've run it for a full year in our new customers. The system is live now for a specialized view for the customer center, which allows us to do a one-call resolution. 30% of customers who call the ISP will call again within the same month. This means not only was their problem not solved, but there were other people whose problem was not solved, but who didn't call a second time, but instead turned to another ISP. This is very critical for ISPs in this coming year. We also have a specialist view where we can escalate problems that the call center agent cannot themselves fix, and specialists within the ISP organization or ours can actually address the problem. We have a proactive maintenance capability that can do zero call resolution. This way, we can actually try fixes without the user actually even being aware of the problem so that we can create non-interrupted user satisfaction. This is a huge booster of net promoter score for ISPs. And last but not least, we actually identify who the ISP can upsell services and hardware to. This is critical because if the ISP does upsell something, such as faster broadband, they should be sure that they can deliver it and not be bottlenecked by things such as Wi-Fi coverage or DSL upgrade capabilities. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, here. Yeah.
Do, do you hear me? Oh, now. Here we go. Um, thank you for a very good presentation. Thanks. It was super clear. Hey, so I didn't really know there was much of a problem with Wi-Fi, but you know, it, it, it explains some of the unhappiness that you do have at home from time to time. But really, how much better is it? Like, how much of a better customer experience can you guys uh, guarantee or predict? And, uh, and, and is it an order of magnitude better? So imagine that the ISPs have actually uh, invested a lot of money in bringing this 100 megabits to the home. When I say more, less than 40% of the time it can be delivered, this is with state-of-the-art modems, the newest stuff rolled out. Older stuff delivers it 0% of the time. So after having spent all these billions of dollars, really, on fiber infrastructure, the ISP can really actually has to own this home Wi-Fi, this last dark patch to their customer, to actually be able to deliver pretty much consistent Wi-Fi service at all. Few, few questions, if I may. Um, one relates to GDPR. You're taking some information from the home and sending it over. Um, you know, how do you address GPR, GDPR issues? You know, even what kind of equipment I have at home? It's like my information. That's one question. The other question is the, um, the business model. How do you price this to the ISPs? And lastly, if you go on Amazon, you can find lots of extenders, sophisticated extenders, and you know, basically you deploy them, and they, you know, okay. can they do the same thing, basically? OK, so I'll, I'll try to get them in order. So the first thing is we were super careful about GDPR, because a lot of companies would go in and collect data indiscriminately. We are very focused on co collecting only local area network information, such as signal strengths, packet rates, and packet losses. This allows us to find problems in this last mile hop. But what we don't do is look at what you're watching, where I you're going. iPads and you know, they were on your slide, there were like the different devices I have at home that the call center could see or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is th those are based on, say, MAC addresses or IP addresses. But we don't look at what people are doing. So we can identify who's in the home. And we protect this data very jealously. However, what we don't do is look at, say, what you're watching or whether you're watching videos at all. This is stuff that we infer from your packet access patterns, for example. Right? So we collect only data to improve the service, and we're very careful about where we're storing it. Uh, your second question was about business model. The business model, yes. So we charge ISPs on a per, so this is essentially a software as a service model. So we charge ISPs per user per year. And of course, the pricing depends a lot on the size of the ISP. If they have millions of users, they'll get a different price versus if they have you know, 50,000 users, they'll get a different price. And your last question, of course, was um, just buying uh, retail range extenders. And this is exactly what we suggest uh, ISPs to never say to users. Because if your internet fails, you will call your ISP. You will not call whoever built your range extender. You'll call your ISP. And if the ISP actually doesn't own this segment of the market as well, then they're blind to support it. The call center doesn't know what's actually being deployed. And they actually have very little visibility into the device itself. So we always say, control your hardware in the home. So I have a question. I'm so excited. Can you, why, um, I guess, how fast can you come to the US and fix Comcast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. Please. <laughs> it's a major source of like, um, issues in my home, let's just say that, that you know, it just, it's constant. So is there, is there anything preventing you from coming in and like working with somebody like a Comcast? Well, uh, yes and no. We would certainly like to move with the US operators, but we found that, of course, the market in the US is dominated by these very large players like Comcast, right? And the, the Nordics are great because we're a startup, and the sales cycle for Nordic operators is much shorter than it would take for us to sell to Comcast. Can, can right? I introduce you, please? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I had, I had two questions. One is, how defensible is your tech? And then the other one was, how are you thinking about diversity in your team? <laughs> you saw the team slide, didn't you? <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, the, the defensibility of the tech is as follows. Uh, in this space, patents, of course, exist. I used to be a patent manager for a company. I, I, I'm very familiar with that. And we, will, we are filing patents. Uh, but the d defensibility is, uh, is really about staying ahead, because it's always generating new algorithms, generating new technology, right? So the, the Defending the position is based on always being the best tech. And your second question was about, yes, the diversity in the team. Uh, 
<laughs> yes, this is certainly a, this is certainly a priority for us. Um, in, at this stage, we're all engineers, sort of, uh, which, which, which we're part of a core team that has been really moving through the time. We are trying to bring back other people that, you know, we had a lot more diversity in the past. Um, and as we grow, our hiring pipeline certainly does hit that point, let me say. Uh, still, still coming back to the sales cycles, because yes. I think that the world doesn't know that many startups that have been surviving operators as customers. And, yes. and I was running once, once upon a time, and I have gray hair now. It, it came from the operators. Um, so what, what are the sales cycles that you're seeing at the moment and kind of a, how, how, how do you see scaling, scaling your operation? So this is why we actually chose the Nordics as our beachhead segment, because uh, there we have ISPs that are relatively smaller in size. The decision maker group is smaller and they have the technical wherewithal to actually evaluate a solution without direct references, right? So they are our direct reference customers, our pilot customers. Next, we choose our larger ISP customers as, uh, as very startup-friendly ones, where there is an internal startup organization within the ISP that drives the ISP in a way that will not kill a startup. The regular sales I used to sell to ISPs as a larger company, and I know that the normal way they buy kills startups. So we choose ISPs who have this organization within that goes and tells the guy I'm talking to, you need to answer this guy this week, you need to not kill him, you need to not negotiate in a way that will crush his margin. So yes, Aaron, thanks. Important. That's up to time. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For Aaron.